is true. But you can cast stuff in JavaScript. So we could make true cast to one if we wanted to, which means you could do true plus true equals two. Anyone know what this is going to do? False. Let's see what else I got off the top of my head just for fun. The array one's fun, yeah. Anyone know what's going to happen here? It's true, as you'd expect. In a uh, double equals operator, or sometimes called the abstract equals operator, it'll cast the thing on the right. Um, so if I'm uh, doing this, it's actually false. And when something's false on the right, it's going to cast it to an integer, which means it'll cast the other side to an integer, which effectively is like saying is 1 equal to 1, which is why this guy is equal to this guy. Another way to do this would be to say uh, false. Oops. Ah, you get the idea. Fuck it. Let's talk about what we're supposed to talk about. Um, so uh, my name is Brian. I uh, work in Adobe with Christopher Joseph here. Um, and you probably know that we work on the PhoneGap team. Um, but we also started working on a new problem at Adobe. And uh, that was CSS. And so our answer um, is top coat. And the sort of pitch tagline is it's CSS for building fast and clean apps. And everybody is already thinking, well, why the hell are these guys doing another CSS framework? Um, and <laughs> there's a lot of them, right? We've got Twitter Bootstrap. We've got uh, Zurb Foundation. There's a new thing from uh, Yahoo called Pure, which is cool. Um, the, the problem that we were running into consistently, uh, at least in PhoneGap land, is people will go to build an application, and they'll, they'll quickly grab Twitter Bootstrap, and they'll throw it in there, and their app will be slow, and they'll be like, oh, PhoneGap sucks which um, isn't entirely true. So uh, <laughs> Twitter Bootstrap uh, is a meg of CSS. There's a good chance you do not need that much CSS to make your buttons consistent on a single platform. Um, the other problem is Twitter Bootstrap changes all the time. And so there's upgrades uh, you have to do. And they change their class names when they're doing it. And so maintenance is a huge uh, problem. Yeah, so uh, another huge issue is uh, the the patterns that are inside of Bootstrap are, are huge and, and kind of all-encompassing and comprehensive. And think about the context of being a website, not an app. Um, so these were all these problems that we were running into. And then uh, Christopher was working on the Reflow team at Adobe. And they were running into the same kind of problems uh, building desktop applications. And we thought, well, OK, if we're building desktop apps and we're building native mobile apps uh, using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, and we're running into these problems, maybe we can work together to solve them. So another issue uh, with CSS is the dogpile syndrome. So you'll take, uh, you'll take your, your Twitter bootstrap or your Zurb foundation. You'll have this gigantic file, and you'll want to start adding stuff to it. Um, and instead of going in and looking at what all those other classes are, you'll just start adding stuff to it, which means you get more and more CSS over time. Um, this is terrible for maintenance, and it's really hard to perform upgrades. And so you end up just getting more and more CSS added at the end and not less. And if you look at a lot of tools that analyze CSS now, um, it, it's really common to have like a class that gets used once in an application, which is crazy. Um, so we, we want to fix this. The first thing that we decided to do was to focus on performance. Um, I don't think any other CSS framework has ever been approached this way. If they have, I'm sorry. Um, but what we're doing, we're not just saying that we're, we're focusing on performance, but we're benchmarking everything we do. So, I was talking to the uh, Brackets team, and I'm like, OK, how are you guys dealing with performance? And, and they're crazy. There was a talk about this yesterday where they were using high-speed cameras to like see people's type speed and all kinds of nutty stuff. And I mentioned it to Paul Irish, and he's like, oh, you should just use the Chrome telemetry API. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. What's that? And he's like, ah, well, it's not really documented, but you can find out about it. So we did. We dug in. And Chrome telemetry API lets us um, measure all kinds of performance metrics on, on page load, uh, on layout, and on uh, frames per second. And so as we're building top coat, we have all these discrete components. We're taking them and adding a whole bunch to a page, and we're scrolling that page up and down. What are you going for? Oh, yeah, OK. 
we scroll the page up and down a whole bunch of times and we take that data and so we know on each commit whether or not we're making top coat faster or slower. And so by saying performance is our first consideration, this isn't just a statement like we're, we're you know, marketing to you, but we're actually trying to be empirical about it and know that we're getting faster over time. Um, this, all this stuff, by the way, is open source. And so we're hoping at some point once we tool this up and we get it working well enough for ourselves that we'll be able to share this or you'll be able to use this for your top code based application. So you, as your app evolves over time, you'll know if you're making it faster or slower. Um, this is all the data that we're exposing to from telemetry too, so. Yeah, telemetry. Each, each component has to. This is cool. So like these are all the various data points that you can pull out. <coughs> I love that jank is not only a word now, it's a technical term. Um, I actually looked it up the other day. And the person who created the word jank is actually in the audience right over here. Her name's Joni Rostalka. Um, so it's a bit of a synthetic benchmarking, though. Our assumption right now is that um, if we're making things faster in Chrome, it gets faster everywhere else, which is not probably a really true statement. Um, and once the other browsers give us the ability to instrument them and get this kind of data out of them, we're totally going to approach those two. Uh, right now, Chrome's our best bet. And I, I think it's pretty safe to say if it gets slower in Chrome, it's going to be slower elsewhere. Um, this is a preview of a top coat based application. Um, this app was built for Adobe Max for uh, iOS and Android, both handset and tablet form factors in four weeks, which is amazing. Uh, it performs really great. You could check it out for yourself. Um, that gives you an idea what it looks like. So uh, Christopher did a lot of the development, and we have a lot of sort of different design goals that are not necessarily complementary or competing. Um, they're just things that are important to us that I don't think have been important to traditional CSS frameworks. So the first thing that's important to us is that we want to be able to compose our builds. And Christopher's going to give a demo of this uh, in a minute. But the idea here is that we're separating the reset from the layout, from the aesthetic, from the platform that it's running on. And so if you're on iOS, you don't get a bunch of Gecko prefixes. But when you go over to Firefox OS, you'll get all the right Mozilla prefixes. Um, you might not want all the aesthetics turned on or off, so maybe you just want the reset. And so you can compose builds of all these controls with just those things. Um, as a kind of consequence of having an architecture that has discrete builds and performance as a first characteristic, we wanted to make this thing super modular for our own purposes too. So uh, making these things separate um, boils right down to how we manage ourselves in GitHub. So if you jump into GitHub slash topcoat, this does look a little crazy, but all of the controls are in individual Git repos. But this wins us a huge benefit that that means that when you're developing using topcoat, and we update the button for a bug, only button updates and you don't have to upgrade your entire top code installation. Right now, when you're working with something like Twitter Bootstrap or Zurb Foundation, it's an all or nothing proposition. You have to change a lot of files. Uh, these builds aren't discrete and they're not independently versioned. When they update button, they have to rev this entire CSS file, which is not ideal. Um, extensibility is another thing. So I showed you the benchmark server, which um, I'm really excited about. We talked to a whole bunch of JavaScript and CSS developers about how they're building applications. And they basically, especially pros, like Dave Shea said, I'm not going to use this shit. I'm a craftsman. And we're like, oh, OK, well, that's cool. And then he saw our benchmarking stuff, and he's like, but I want that. And so we think the more important output of top code isn't actually the CSS that you can use, although that's a cool thing. It's probably the tools we're using to build top code itself. Um, so we're hoping that this is kind of a, something that will encourage people to start building applications that are performant by default instead of uh, hucking a huge one meg CSS file at us and telling us we're slow. Um, another angle is that, and this is funny because I'm at JSConf, but uh, top code is only CSS. Um, but ironically, almost all of top code is written using JavaScript, it's a node. So um, we didn't want any client dependency. I personally have hated that about other CSS frameworks, that they're like, oh, we're a framework, but you also have to load a whole bunch of jQuery plugins for some reason. Um, not everybody likes jQuery, like me. Um, so, <laughs> and Pete Higgins, I guess. Uh, top code's open source, like everything we do. Uh, it's Apache 2 license. Everything's on GitHub. We're looking for people to help us build it. Um, our audience is the web community, but that's everybody that's building apps. And this is also a little bit of a fuzzy consideration. It's not something I think you should take too seriously, but we're building top coat for people building applications, and in particular applications that are installed. Um, things like brackets and reflow, but also PhoneGap. 
And when you're building an app, there's a slight UI design idioms that are different uh, than if you're building a website. Topcoat will work for websites, um, but instead of making websites the first consideration, we want to make the interaction and design patterns um, for web apps, which is where we think the web is going. And it's maybe not just the web is going this way, but operating systems are going this way. You've got Chrome OS, uh, Windows Blue, I guess they're calling it now. It was like Windows RT or Metro before, but it's, it's essentially J JavaScript. Firefox OS ties in, and we won't talk about Web OS. Um, these, are all, these are all web operating systems. So you've got Google, Microsoft, Mozilla, Samsung, Intel, and I guess LG, uh, all betting on the web as the future for operating systems. So Topcoat's probably got a good future in those places. And in the rest of it, we can deal with PhoneGap. Uh, so if you want to check out the controls themselves, we've done a really kind of ponzi job but of, of showing this stuff off. But if you go to the topcoat.io domain, we're going to do a new site very soon. Uh, you can get a preview of what the different controls look like. There's not a lot of surprises here. This is just CSS, and these are just like basic controls. Um, this aesthetic is generated. These aren't things that we're telling you you have to build it. Um, this stuff looks very Adobe, and that's probably because it's coming out of Adobe. But the theming capability allows you to change absolutely every attribute of, uh, of these controls. Um, I kind of mentioned that there's some perceived competitors. I don't think they really are uh, until they get into, well, I say this all the time, too, and people think it's f but. The, the, the principles of top code are uh, around performance, modularity, discreteness, uh, and uh, accessibility. Uh, basically, everything that these things don't do, we do. So I don't know if they are competitors. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff for top code. So it's CSS generally, but we also have a bunch of grunt-based tooling. You get generated style guides, which Christopher will show you. Um, sample apps, starter apps. Uh, we have a PSD for prototyping. Uh, we also have a whole bunch of SVG icons, which are pretty sweet, that came out of Adobe, um, and uh, two fonts, which uh, will probably grow, given the Typekit thing. So there's no JS yet, but that's not to say there won't be JS at some point in the future. Um, we're really not stoked on the idea of creating a JavaScript framework, but there is some shit that the web just does not do properly yet, like touch events that we may want to polyfill for controls. Um, but we don't tell you how to do templating. We don't tell you how to build your framework. We're not going to touch any of that because um, there's no right or wrong way. So top code's being released on the same Agile release train that PhoneGap and Apache Cordova follow. So it's a release every month, not a release every six months. Um, and it follows major minor patch. You can check out our backlog on GitHub. Um, it's actually kind of sweet. We're using this thing called Hueboard, which I had never heard of. Uh, but I like it. Oh, no, the Wi-Fi is hosed. Oh, wait. No, it's back. Sweet. So I have to scroll down a little bit off top coat. You can go check out our backlog. This Hueboard thing is pretty sweet. As you can see, we've got a lot coming down the pipeline, and we have a lot of ideas on uh, what we'd like to see happen. But if you want to check that out, uh, please go ahead. Filing issues is contributing. Uh, release train, empirical, so CI driven, you got that. Uh, platform support, I originally was going to put like a bunch of browsers with their numbers on them, but browsers update every six weeks, and I don't feel like updating slides every six weeks, so whatever. Modern browsers, you get it. Um, there's three ways to use top code. You can use it the same way you use Bootstrap today by including everything. Don't recommend doing that for production. Um, there's an a la carte way of building it right now, which we'll show you. It's super easy. It uses a package JSON. You can choose which controls you want, which aesthetic you want, and which platforms you want to support. And as a bonus, you get a style guide as you're building it. Oh, and theming. Theming's kind of different, and this is something that's totally up for debate. Um, we agonized about making themes something off the each control themselves, but we're putting themes into its own singular Git repo right now for the moment. And we don't know if this is completely correct or not, but essentially you would fork top code slash theme. There's a bunch of variable files in here. Some of them are kind of gross, but they're not bad. Um, to give you an idea, you would give it a theme dash whatever, and it will create that theme for yeah, this one, good example. Oh, yeah, if we're using stylus also. We're not totally locked into that, but we think it's you know, better than some of the alternatives, and we wanted to be nodey about things. 
Yeah, so you would just fork this, you'd modify the variables, and you'd have your own theme. Um, current status, it's, uh, we just did a point three release. We're gonna do a point four probably any day now. Um, people are building apps already using Topcoat today. Um, it's only gonna get better in the future as we add more, more and more controls. Um, there are some concerns that remain. So the first thing people have been asking us, if you go to the Topcoat homepage, you'll see that we're treating desktop and mobile as separate which is making responsive design people mad at us. And I think it's, it's a valid thing to like strive for uh, responsive design, but I also don't think that it's something that has been fully solved with the technology we have today. Responsive design boils down to the idea of media queries and match media in the JavaScript side of things. And uh, when you want to do it, uh, you have a whole bunch of CSS, and then you, can, you have to download all that CSS, and then you basically conditionally will decide which stuff you're going to show when. Um, this is really inefficient, especially as we have tons and tons of devices out there. Uh, if you're downloading all the desktop CSS to your phone um, on an edge connection just to load a small subset of it, you're, hitting, you're taking a huge network penalty, but you're also taking a big penalty to the heap um, when it's trying to parcel this CSS. So we're treating these as separate problems. I think a lot of these controls will eventually will become responsive, as it were, and they'll be all in one thing. Um, but for the moment, we're not convinced, and I don't think the technology is completely there either. So we're, we're going to, again, be empirical about it and approach it um, discreetly. Uh, we're using Stylus. Some people like that. Some people don't. Um, but you're not using Stylus. Contributing to top code is a lot different than consuming it. You're consuming CSS. That's the, the abstraction layer you're at. Um, if you don't like Stylus, that's cool. Tell us what you do, I guess. Um, and there's complexity trade-offs in our approach. We have lots of Git repos, which means that we have lots of versions of things. I think this complexity is worth the trade-off when you start architecting a larger application, um, but that's, that's definitely up for debate, too. Um, there's definitely risks. So first thing that, to address is that we're not trying to build Flex again at Adobe. Um, and in fact, we want to create a, a much larger community around the idea of open web stuff, and we want to fix the performance characteristics we see built in apps today. Um, this isn't a framework. Code size and quality is kind of the thing that we're most concerned about. Uh, so we have to stay on top of ourselves with that, but that's what the CI infrastructure is for. And interoperation with other JavaScript frameworks is also a huge uh, thing that we want to make sure is, is first class. So we were talking to the Ember guys. Uh, we told the Backbone guys they don't care. Um, <laughs> and the Angular guys. Uh, so there's going to be bindings for all these JavaScript frameworks so they interoperate. And our idea is that if you know whatever way you build an app, uh, we'll work with you. Uh, I bring up revenue drivers because people ask, they're like, well, is Adobe just going to do this thing and then abandon it? And the answer is no. Um, there is a big internal win for us to have reuse at Adobe, but there's also a larger win when we see our tooling start adopting this stuff and treating it as a first-class citizen. Uh, you could imagine the benchmarking data we're doing could become available in a tool like Brackets in the future, um, which is a huge opportunity. So we should be shipping point four, I guess, in the next day, or else I'm a liar. Um, and uh, point 0.5 coming in June, and then July, I think we're going to ship one for PhoneGap Day. There's a ton of stuff in our roadmap. Uh, I won't go through all of these because you can read. I'll just highlight one of them. Uh, it's called Turbo Mode. We think we found a way to make uh, CSS even faster still. Uh, if you're curious about that, ask me later. Uh, what, what the hell is Turbo Mode? And um, we have all the common sort of community touch points. GitHub's probably the best place to go, but topcoat.io. Um, we want to see the web be a first-class dev platform by building apps that are fast by default instead of ones uh, that are slow. In order for us to do that, we need your help. Um, and you can find out more at topcoat.io, but we're going to demo it for you now. I guess, do you want to use your machine or mine? Okay. So Christopher's got the latest bits. And he's going to build an app really quickly, and then I'll pull that down from GitHub and I'll build it into PhoneGab, and then we can go get pool beers. You just yell at me. Yell at you, so, <laughs> so I'm in the top coat. I'm in the top coat directory. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so let's show let's show you what we're doing here. So I have this package JSON file, and we're actually we're thinking about moving the top code part out into its own JSON file. Let us know what you think about that. Oh, you didn't mention the uh, the Google mailing list. We should probably. We're going to start post. We po we're going to be posting all these ideas and considerations on the Google mailing list, so people can tell us how dumb we are and troll us to death. Um. We've seen other people. So there's like uh, Component and Bauer uh, are having a cat fight over who gets to own Component JSON, and we didn't really want to get involved. And then we're like, well, everyone has a package JSON now. We'll just put it under a top coat uh, global. Seems like a fairly okay thing to do. Um, because there's that file there already. We already have like license notice, git ignore, package JSON, grunt file. We didn't really want to add another one necessarily. So, well, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, and also we got burned pretty bad when we switched from the Adobe org to Topcoat org and Bauer couldn't unregister us. So we actually couldn't push our bits up. So we had to go with this, which I actually am pretty happy with. Um, as Brian talked about, these are corresponding, these skins are corresponding to GitHub repos. So it's just Topcoat slash button. If you had your own button, it'd be your username slash button. Um, these numbers, these version numbers are actually the tag versions of the components in, in, of the GitHub repo. So um, we actually have support for nightlies by just removing the tag number and then you can get a nightly version of uh, the component. So if you're doing development time, you can actually see that. So this is the list of components I'm gonna build, right? So I just run grunt and Wi-Fi should work. Goes down, pulls down all those tag versions as zips. Uh, obviously if I had a nightly, it would just do a shallow clone instead. Puts it into the right place runs a compile step um, using stylus. And I've done the same kind of stuff that um, you would want to, right? Like I've, I've sequestered the brain damage of compile into its own task. So if we were to switch to, uh, to like rework or something, we could just switch that one file and everything would work the same. If you, were, if you really wanted to do SAS, like I saw someone fork top coat, removed all the modularity and started putting SAS in as, as git submodules, it would have been much easier just to change the compile task to use SAS instead of stylus, and that's why I built it that way. Um, we totally want to work with these like open package managers and stuff, but we think the space is like immature and broken. So we're just using Grunt because we're pretty sure you are too. Um, but I'm like fully open to like trying to figure out a better way to do this. There's that new initiative from Google that used to be called Tool Kitchen. What are they calling Polymer. 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 So like I think the future is web components, but I don't think the future is here yet. And so we're just sticking to JavaScript and CSS uh, as the rawest form possible until such time as the tools are better. Right. So this is we're using Style Delco right now for our generated style guides. Um, give us feedback on that. We actually have another version that looks more like our our designer generated style guides that um, we could switch to. But this tends to have all the features that you could possibly have. Right. It's like the kitchen sink of style guide features. So people wanted to vote on which ones they wanted to keep. But basically, it'll show you all of the components that I had in that package JSON already compiled and with use of examples, so you can just copy and paste. Um, so you go down here, you know, lists, nav, header, nav bar, and it actually has a working button as an example. And then, you know, we talked about um, responsive. And like, this header is responsive, if right? But it's not made in a responsive way. It doesn't use media queries. It's actually just a percentage-based header. You could use it that way. Um, this is kind of a nice, whoa. Uh, sorry, uh, I think like a super nice feature because um, if you saw Nicole's presentation, if you don't have a living style guide, then you probably have a static one and you end up with 50 buttons that look the same, um, that copy paste CSS. And so our hope is that people will use this tool uh, to build out their apps. They'll jump into this generated style guide and then they will copy and paste, but they'll be copy and pasting from something more canonical and managed. Right. Um, so. That's it. So basically, if you follow the readme, it just you just include whichever version of the um, style guide, uh, nope, CSS, CSS, CSS theme that you want. <laughs> um, just you just link it like CSS because it's just CSS, and then you just copy and paste from from here the usage the usage guys. And I I encourage people to play with these, like you know, leave something out of the list or leave something out of the header and see what it does. We're separating things like um, layout. If you look, it's like layout and positioning, you know, this is, I have these really dumb layout classes like quarter, half, full, but I, I'm totally intending people to use their own grid system or their own layout classes for the elements. And then I just want to see what people use so that I can actually build those things in or make it support those things better. Um, we have our own grid system, but I don't want to impose that on anyone. So we separate all the concerns. Um, so I went and did a really quick and dirty example using Topcoat. And I just, all I did was I went in, linked the CSS and then copy and pasted the styles. And then um, I added, 
really minimal JavaScript just for the click handler and added some, um, we're gonna separate transitions too. So we'll have a whole set of transitions um, under top coat that just use CSS animations. Actually, we're both super interested in if you have opinions about this one. We don't really have an answer, but um, is slide left a component? Maybe, right? I'm not totally sure. And what I am sure of is when you look into backbone apps, very often you will see a shitload of visual display logic where it'll be like sliding things left and right or whatever. And I don't know if your controller should know that, right? Like, I think your controller should know about the state of the models that are around. Like, it should know that, you know, I'm showing users right now, but should it know that the users came in from the bottom? I don't know if it should. Yeah. And that's kind of the nice thing about CSS is it's very declarative and you keep that presentation business out of your controllers. So, right. um, talk to us about that. Right, so we're trying to separate concerns and the way that we're approaching people saying, so I actually got a bug, an issue request saying, hey, you should have a uh, slide out menu component and I said to that, I'm like, well, the way that we're handling those requests is we're actually gonna make examples, right? We're gonna make examples and composing these different patterns and then give you all the pieces and you can compose your own. I figure you could come up with something way more creative than the slide menu if you had all the pieces and you could put them together like Legos, right? Um, so that's that. I pushed this up to, to um, GitHub. Again, it was just quick and dirty this morning, <laughs> like <laughs> trying to get this working so that we could demo it. Oh. All right, so let's see if we can phone gap it. Yeah, do you wanna um, plug your yeah, I'll swap with you. So, uh, oh yeah, that confused me. Oh no, not that. What's up with that? Turn on mirroring. Okay, cool. Uh, so I downloaded a fresh build of PhoneGap 2.7. 2.8 should be coming out today. Steve here? <laughs> Is it coming out today or what? <laughs> All right, good enough. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hating Steve. Um, so when you download PhoneGap, you get a lib directory and well, inside of there, there's a bunch of mobile platforms um, in the future, we're going to have a CLI tool that wraps all this up so you don't have to look at these guts, but you'll always have these guts available to you. And I'm going to go uh, iOS, then create. Uh, we have these command line tools that normalize all the weird shit that different platforms do. Um, and one of them is create. And so I'm going to create a project on my desktop. I'm going to call it, I don't know, JSConf. Whoa. Top code. io.brian.jsconf and jsconf top code. Whoops. So that's going to generate a native project on my desktop uh, called jsconf top code. Here it is right here. This is just an iOS project. Um, and it's got a WW folder. So let's let's quickly build that to make sure that I didn't break the world. So we have these command line tools like Cordova Run, which is consistent across platforms, uh, creating projects, logging, emulating, building, whatever. So if you're working inside of iOS, uh, you can just switch context to Android with, with uh, out too much trouble. So that should have worked, and it did. There's an app that we built. It's exciting. So I'm going to open this directory up and I'm just going to delete everything except for that Cordova JS file. And I think I pulled down your, uh oh. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to jump onto my desktop, get clone, I don't remember. It's like GitHub slash Krista. I dare you to spell my name right. <laughs> I did. I did it. Woo. Got your name right. <coughs> okay, so you already had a. Uh, yeah, that's, well, that's fine. You can just copy paste it. Yeah. Whoa. What happened? I don't know. I've never seen it do that before. What's up with that? 
Oh, the line wrapping. That's cool. That's it's all it's all of our splash screens. It's our overzealous designer. 15 meg splash screen. Um, I wish I was joking. I'm not. Um, it's got a sweet gradient though. Uh, so where is that top coat phone gap? Just get the copy and paste that mess to desktop JS conf top coat ww place all this stuff. <laughs> Cross our fingers. Oh. Re recompile. Oh, did it? Oh, I have to kill this simulator first. I'm also running the Android SDK on a Mac Air, so that always works out well. Let's try this again. Go. Go. <laughs> there we go. Oh, no. Bad cache. Hold on. All right. This is a uh, native dev demo gods combo. Of awesome. So sometimes you got to go into Xcode. And, <laughs> and the running joke is that don't worry about Xcode. It's just like Eclipse, except it looks like iTunes. <laughs> <laughs> and you got to do like a build and clean. What the fuck is that? Actually, this might just work. Come on, Xcode. Get your shit together. <laughs> it is launching. Right? Oh, wait. Whoa. I went into an iPad, I guess. Yay! There's our native mobile app running on an iPad. So I guess we could improve this by doing this in a iOS context. Let's just quickly do this in a handset. So you could media query this up all you want. We're not going to tell you how to build your app because um, pe people that do suck. Uh, there we go. That was the Android one. Yeah, the Android yeah. one failed. <laughs> They weren't even talking to you, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. It looks looks good, though, right? There you go. And we don't have an hour, so we're not going to show you Android. <laughs> so yeah, Topcoat, it's thing. Uh, we need your help. Uh, check out topcoat.io. Tweet at us. Uh, and uh, let us know the types of stuff you're looking for. For PhoneGap, uh, we're hoping to start preloading with lots of example apps so that building apps across platforms that look good by default and are fast uh, are a thing. Um, thanks. And questions, I guess? Yeah? Yeah, we're into Bower. And as soon as they close a few bugs, we'll totally do that. Um, we, we, like them and Component and all these different client-side package managers um, are almost there. They're just not quite there. Uh, in the particular case for Bower, we did publish there. And then we changed repo names. And they have a bug where we can't change repo names. And so, yeah. Yeah, well, it, yeah, it's open source now. Um, telemetry is a little tricky to get at today. You have to do your own like custom build of CEF, uh, which isn't 
as bad as it sounds. Um, but in the future, the idea would be that this tooling is fully automated on an app per app level so that you as a developer would get notified that, hey, you just made shit slower um, when you change something. And also to his point, oh. Oh, I should have repeated your question. Um, the question was, are we going to expose Topcoat's benchmarking facilities to the public? It, it already is. It's uh, top uh, GitHub slash Topcoat slash Topcoat dash server. It's weird. I'm like <laughs> um, umbilical to you. <laughs> so, so we're doing at a at a component level right now, but then we're going to work on, like you said, at a um, at a page, like a whole app level as well, right? We're just we just haven't gotten to that part because we've only been working on it for a couple months. Any other questions? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, so at the moment, we just give you CSS. And oh, the, the question is, we have desktop and we have mobile. Um, and you know, how, what are we recommending, or how do you know when to use which? Um, we're right now just giving you the CSS flat out. And we're leaving it up to you to decide how, how to architect your app. Um, I'm hoping in the future, like we're, we're going to be doing lots of experiments around responsive uh, style designs to, to see for ourselves. We're, right now, the state we're at is we're actually just building a bunch of apps. Um, we don't want to get too enterprise architect on this and tell people the, the right way before we've actually, you know, used it. So <laughs> that's our that's our approach. Yep. Um, are we creating replacements for the native, yeah. like com controls? Yeah. Yep. Um, those are all coming. So we're taking big lists. We actually did a ton of design research uh, around what apps are using um, and what types of controls they need. And selects and all that stuff is coming, for sure. Like soon. Like really soon, yeah. Is that design research available? The design research is all available, yeah, actually. Oh, man. I hope I can find it. It's, it's under top. Yeah. Topcode.io slash docs. Uh, yeah, it's at 404. <laughs> 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 Uh, no, I did, it here, let me find it. It's in there. It's under the... There's also stuff. some in our wiki. Yeah. And actually, the design research was really interesting. If you got to, if you were lucky enough to get to go to CSS Conf, we, we had the lead uh, design manager walk through it all. It's pretty cool. Uh, doc? Yeah. Doc. Recommendation is to know. Huh, I was really close. Oh, we're just um, muttering to ourselves yes. right now. There's been absolutely no content in the last minute, don't worry. Um, just trying to find where the design research is. Uh, kind of a really awesome benefit of being at Adobe is that we have a lot of badass XD people that uh, really love nerding out on this. And so they did a ton of research into how could we create something um, that's visually clean, easily stylable, and will come, on, come off as fast uh, when it gets implemented. All of that research is open source too. Yeah, and, and so we're, um, we're, we're like you said, we're redoing the website right now to make to expose the research documentation as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh. No, no other questions. Oh, yes, Remy. Ah. <laughs> uh. Okay, uh, I'll talk a little bit about, tur so Remy's asking what's turbo mode. It's something that we're looking at bringing in the future. Um, it, it's an idea uh, extracted from famo.us. Um, these guys created a crazy demo where they have this amazing sphere that's moving around at like lightning speeds. And if you look at their source, the way they did this was by avoiding the render pipeline in WebKit. And the way they do that is by setting a uh, style attribute on every single element in the DOM using a physics engine to programmatically position everything in a 3D space using a matrix transform. So if it sounds gross, it is, <laughs> but it's also super fast. And so we think we can apply this technique into Topcoat to do like really crazy transitions at like super high speeds. It's only going to work in WebKit, but um, yeah, that's what Turbo Mode will be. Famo.us. What are you 404 in on? Uh, typing on a MacBook Air is killing me. Uh, I was trying to show, there's a bunch of slides from Neat Topcoat, and it's not working. 
I'll put those up in a way that you can get to them. But you can actually step through. There's some slides. Oh my God. There's some slides that you can step through and it actually shows step by step of the research process. All right. Thanks, everybody.